Hey guys, it's not Q&A Tuesday. Hey guys, and welcome to another edition of What's on My Desk. And today I am answering a viewer in regards to the history of the Rolex Oyster or the, the Rolex Oyster case in the big way. So stay tuned. So this is not a Q&A Tuesday, this is a what's on my desk. There was a gentleman that asked me to talk about the history of the Rolex Oyster case, right? And I apologize in advance, that was one of the questions I lost. So I don't know who you are, but comment below if you're watching and let us know. So let's talk about the Rolex Oyster case. And I said I, I'm gonna do it in a big way is because I have the very first Rolex Oyster case that was made in the mid 20s. And let me show you this beauty and let me tell you, it looks nothing like any current Rolex that you would think of. It's tiny, it's dinky, a little bit of a reminiscence of current oysters. Screw down crown, screw down back, right? The bezel may be a subtle reminder of some of the current be bezels that Rolex has. Maybe the turner graph is probably the closest thing I can think of. Outside of the fact that this thing says Rolex on a dial from afar, you would not dub this as a Rolex whatsoever, and I don't think anybody would. So following the end of World War I, Global trading sort of resumed and Rolex watches were being sent abroad, particularly to the hot and humid tropical countries of the British Empire. As a result of this long travel, as you can imagine by boat, right, and into those hot areas, the watches would arrive rusty. I don't have to explain to you guys what rust does to a watch. Originally, these cases were bought in three parts, case body, back, and bezel, with the back and the bezel hinged to the case body, preventing the case from being waterproof due to the gap that it created, right? Hans Wilsdorf, right, co-founder of Rolex, he was determined and said, I am going to make a waterproof watch. We must succeed in making a watch case so tight that our movements will be permanently guaranteed against damage caused by dust, perspiration, heat, and cold. Only then will the perfect accuracy of the Rolex watch be secured. So he was punning at the fact that Rolexes were a perfect measuring tool, obviously, but at the same token, realizing that, look, there's a need for a waterproof case because these watches are just getting ruined. And as you can imagine, it didn't do a whole lot of good to the name Rolex when, you know, when the people ordered a bunch of Rolexes and they would arrive ruined. So the hermetically sealed oyster provided optimal protection for the movement. And it did it thanks to the genius case, right? You have your screw down crown, a screw down bezel, right? This bezel here is actually a screw down. And of course, your screw down case back. Going back to what Hans said, case and movement were considered as one in the overall goal of improving chronometric performance. If Hans Wilsdorf presented the Oyster case as such an important invention, it was down to the fact that its waterproofness also contributed greatly to maintaining precision over long term. The waterproofness was famously attested in 1927 when the Oyster watch was worn by the British swimmer Mercedes Glitze on one of her swims across the English Channel. I'm gonna show it to you on the wrist next to my sky dweller just to see how far we've come in terms of size, right? This thing is tiny. It's actually 32 millimeters, which is actually considered, probably considered to be a decent sized watch for the times. So now what I don't have on here is I don't have the original strap. I don't have the original buckle. This is an aftermarket strap with some old aftermarket buckle. So it's very rare to find these things, but it's original strap for sure because the straps get destroyed over time and the, the strap gets ripped off. What was done is just put it on any old strap with any old buckle. I know you're gonna ask me what these things are selling for and, and to tell you that I honestly know the answer to that, I do and I don't. Uh, the answer I got is from an old Rolex ad showing this particular watch. If you, Ian, if you can pop that on the screen. And that also has prices on it. And, and on here it said 18 karat gold, 15 British gold. Pounds. 15 British pounds is what this thing cost in the late 20s. The ad also shows you a couple of variations of this particular watch, so this wasn't the only one. You also had a couple that was somewhat square, rounded off squares, you can see that in the ad as well. 6,000 pounds, today that's roughly about seven, eight thousand dollars would get you a plain Jane Rolex Perpetual Oyster case, right? Pretty cool, huh? So I guess uh, Rolex hasn't overpriced themselves, if you, especially if you look at over 100 years, right? Moving right along, I also brought another very special watch, which is the 5975, right? In 2014, and I apologize in advance, this thing is sealed. I don't really want to take it out of its package because it affects the value, which is a whole side note I'll talk about later. But this is the 5975J. And as you can see in the back, 
It is to celebrate. It was part of the watches that were released in 2014 to celebrate their 175th anniversary, right? When these things came out, AD's phones were ringing off the hook because every paddock collector wanted one of these. It is a chronograph. It is not your average chronograph. If you notice, there are no counters on this watch, right? Your typical round counters that you would see in a chronograph. All you see is these scales, right? A bunch of scales, 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 scales. What are these scales about? I'll tell you in just a second. I okay, will show you one more thing though. This is the buckle. The buckle is also special. It also carries the anniversary markings on the buckle itself. The year is right here on the bottom. Let's talk about the multi-scale chronograph, right? What does this thing actually do? Let's talk about the pulsometer scale, right? Now, what is the pulsometer scale? Well, the name gives it away, right? It allows physicians to measure your pulse in a lot less than a minute because it's calibrated to 15 pulsation. Outside of that, you see the telemeter scale, which allows you to calculate distance between the speed of light and the speed of sound. Uh, this is something near and dear to my heart because this is something we did without a fancy Patek Philippe watch when I was in the service. It's called the flash to bang is what we called it in the military. Right? That's how you kind of, you can kind of gauge how far the enemy may be. So if, when a tank fires, fires from far away, an artillery fires run, you see a flash, you just go one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, and every second roughly equals to one kilometers, allowing you to kind of gauge how close or far the enemy is. You can also often use it in everyday life to find out how far the lightning is. So when you see the flash, start counting one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and eventually you'll know how far that lighting actually is when you hear the boom. Paddock is not the only one that came out with this type of watch, right? There's a lot of other brands that came out with similar functionality watches and they're very popular with collectors. For the most part, due to the technical appearance of this watch, I would say, right? Because it looks very techy. Uh, Rarity, obviously, is another one. Uh, but for the most part, usefulness. This is a pretty useful watch. Now, often you will find some of these older pieces accompanied by the two register you used to see in a chronograph, the 30 minute register and the 60 seconds register. But Paddock decided not to include those registers. So technically, it's not a chronograph, right? It doesn't have the register, it's not a chrono. So theoretically, it's not a chronograph. It's a tool to measure pulse, distance, and speed, as it doesn't really record time in any way over 60 seconds. So it was pretty, it was pretty interesting that Paddock decided to go that route. I don't know why they decided to go that route, but this is what they did. I think if you added the two registers onto this watch, I think it would take away from the overall aesthetic look. This watch, to me anyway, first glance is a fancy dressy watch. It's gold, obviously, but it has a very vintage military look. If you added those chronographs on there, I think that would take away probably from the vintage look, not so much from the military look. And again, these are just my opinions. I'm just thinking in terms of look, in reality, nobody's gonna use this as a tool nowadays, okay? You have far better tools out there to include your iPhone and, and, uh, and many, many other things that you could do what this watch is set out to do. Aesthetically, I think they did a perfect job. Okay, now uh, everybody was saying, oh, wait a minute, it's another chronograph. It's another version of the newer 5170, the son of the 5070 chronograph. It's not, this case is actually one millimeter larger. Last but not least, unlike the 5170, this is an automatic. So instead of using the 29-535, I think is the manual um, caliber that's in the 5170, they use the same caliber that they use in the 5990, the 5980, and the 5960, which is caliber 28520. But of course they had to rework it because the whole ordeal with this watch was, again, it's accuracy. So the vertical clutch column wheel chronograph has been, I guess, sort of bumped up, pumped up in terms of precision, right? To make this extremely accurate. If they gave this an exhibition back and maybe an additional back like for the money they're charging, they should have. They, maybe they could have given you two backs, like an exhibition back so you can look at the movement, but at the same time, in the back that says 175th anniversary, or maybe, well, couldn't really put it in the front anywhere. Uh, an engraving around the bezel would probably be pretty cool just the same, but Nevertheless, who am I to tell Paddock what to do? They obviously know what they're doing. So it's not a regular production piece. It is a limited edition, as you guys guessed it. I think they made it in 400 pieces in each metal. And they made it in yellow, white, and uh, rose gold. And platinum was 100 pieces with a black dial. Uh, retail at the time they launched was uh, 55,000 Swiss francs. I think the platinum was around 80,000 Swiss francs. Uh, where are they trading at now? You would think, oh my God, Roman, this is something that should trade through the roof. And there's a reason why I didn't give you guys a price on this Rolex Oyster, because it brings me to my point. A lot of times, not all things limited, not all things super old and super vintage are necessarily worth buku dollars. And I wanted to tell you guys how much you guys, you, and by you, I mean you, the watch collectors, you, the general public that messes around in the world of horology, buying, selling, trading watches all the time matter. It's really on you, right? It's, it's what the general public and the collectors deem to be 
popular right now a lot of dealers have a lot to do with that just the same right dealers such as us specifically not authorized dealers right the aftermarket dealers or the secondary market dealers and the reason for that is because we do trade amongst ourselves but at the end of the day we're not going to start trading stuff amongst ourselves for crazy money if at the end of the day there's not a consumer at the end of that line wanting to buy that watch or many consumers line up to buy, to buy that watch to drive the price up uh, when these first came out of the door they were they were trading through the roof I got to tell you you know there were you know people were asking stupid money for them right because hey it's a limited edition Patek Philippe how many of those are actually out there and I think people were asking a hundred thousand for them 80 uh, 90 thousand for them over a hundred thousand for them but today uh, a if you go online you'll find a lot of them available for sale and you're gonna find them around that original retail price which I don't know what 55 Swiss francs is today but assuming it's one-to-one -one, around 55 to 60 thousand dollars and if you really want it one cheaper call me shameless plugs on that one but uh, long story short Rolex you would think oh my god this is the first Rolex Oyster Perpetual this has to be worth a gazillion dollars but at the end of the day how many of you guys out there would want to wear this watch right how attractive is this watch how impressive is this watch because I always say there's nothing wrong with the show effect right a lot of guys out there when they buy an expensive watch they want to show it off and putting something like this on your wrist isn't exactly showing off it's a dinky old watch in fact most would say it looks like your grandmother's watch right uh, so the fate of this watch is trades from four to five thousand dollars is where these sell watches are selling for. Uh, if you if you may have found one that's complete with original some kind of original paperwork or box or whatever it, packaging it came in, I don't even know what that looks like to be honest with you. Whatever booklets it came with, maybe original receipt of sale or something like that. Maybe in an auction setting, this would fetch around 10 maybe maybe a little bit more to some real collector just wants to put it away and you know create a timeline of Rolex oyster cases or something of that nature but for the most part watches that no matter how old they are no matter how iconic they are this is the most iconic Rolex it's the first oyster right still they suffer the fate where popularity of the general public or general collectors like such as you really drive the price of these particular pieces, both with dealers like us on the secondary market, as well as all other consumers. Why did this watch come down to earth? Uh, I'll be honest with you, I find this watch to be very, very attractive. It sinks to me because of its military style. But again, majority of the public doesn't deem this watch to be as hot. I've heard clients tell me that they think it's absolutely ugly. Uh, I, just because I disagree with that doesn't mean that you can't feel that way either. Again, it's just my opinion versus someone else. Again, there's an ask for every seat. You know, in terms of resale value and things like that, I will tell you this: that uh, because of its sheer low amount of limited, true limited edition watches that Paddock comes out with, uh, you know, long term holds on any limited edition Paddock, <clears throat> I think is a good thing, right? But when I say long term, I'm talking about you know 20, 30, 40 years from now. If I took this thing sealed as it is. Uh, I have this, I have the original shipping, shipping boss that this thing came in, right? And I stuck it in my safe and I woke up 50 years later and pulled it out such as this. Yes, it would fetch buku dollars. But those buku dollars, once again, will never equal. If I were to take the $60,000 today and invest it in just a mutual fund 50 years from now, that would be a whole lot more money than this. Which is why I always say these things are not an investment but an expensive toy. Speaking of things losing steam over time, let's talk about the limited edition Audemars Piguet Maserati in the millionaire case. This was a limited edition trio. During the times where limited edition offshores were hot, and I brought one of those limited editions with me as well, right? Oversized millionaire case, I think this thing measures like 48 millimeters across. This was a limited edition of 900 pieces. They made, I believe, 450 in rows and I think 150 in platinum don't quote me so at the time this thing was launched which was to commemorate Maserati's 90th anniversary right this was yet another partnership created between Maserati and Audemars Piguet and then again we've I've talked in the past in regards to Audemars Piguet in the world of racing in the world of cars and things of that nature but they did it during the time when the limited edition offshore trios were super super hot your Montoyos, your Barrichellos, uh, you know, later your Timalingis and things of that nature. So they followed suit. I believe this was their attempt to lift up the millinery line. What was selling at the time? Offshores. Not even Royal Oaks. Today's Royal Oaks. Back, back then it was offshores that took the cake. Offshores, 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 right? So somebody smart within Audemars Piguet said, let's utilize this hype that we have created about us. We're seeing our Montoya's trading at 10, 10 to $15,000 over list. We're seeing all these limited editions that they're working, the Grand Prix, and even the single edition offshores such as, spoiler alert, 
Pride of Argentina is what I brought here. They only made this in steel and rose, right? There was no platinum Pride of Argentina. The Jay-Z, which was a trio, right? All those limited offshores were selling and they were selling like hotcakes. So let's use that and try to lift up the less popular guy. Same thing that kind of happened with Rolex with the craze of the stainless steel model. All of a sudden you got regular day just twos trading at list and a little bit above. Regular Submariners, which they make millions of trading at list and a little bit above, right? They said, let's see if we can do the same thing with the Maserati. And guess what? It worked. But the reason it worked is not because of you guys, but because of guys like us. Because here we are buying up every limited edition offshore out there under the sun because they're selling like hotcakes. Everybody wants them. They keep climbing in price. Why wouldn't the Maserati do the same thing? Lots of history. been around since 1914, right? Uh, why not? This should do well. And well, it did. These things came out of the gate. The stainless steel of Maserati is what trading upwards of mid-20s. To high 20s, the rose gold people were asking 45 to 50 thousand, and the platinum people were asking 75 to 80, and a few of those pieces sold. But after the smoke clears, right, and people actually realize what they have in their hand, they're saying, "Well, you know what? I don't like this watch as much as I like the offshores. It's also not so cool to have this versus an offshore because this is not the coolest watch that's out there." And lo and behold, slowly but surely, they started going down. And it's not like the prices crashed on them because this thing now trades on, way under $10,000. It's not like the prices went from $27,000 down to $5,000, right? It slowly but surely starts to go down in price, right? Because the demand goes down. So what the guys like us do, when we see the demand going down, we tend to pay less for them back in trade. And this is how it kind of all trickles down until it gets down to a price where it's not reasonable to go down any further for a watch such as this in price because this is still a very cool watch it's a dual time power reserve the way the power reserve indicator is done is reminiscent of a car dashboard right you have your day and night indicator here it is an automatic it is a nice large size watch was never crazy about the brown strap though everybody's ever bought a maserati from me we changed it to a black strap i just don't see how the brown strap works here. And oddly enough, the rose gold came on a black stitch strap where the steel one came on a brown strap. I don't know if that was a mix up to begin with and they just said, the hell with it, let's keep it that way. But I would think it would work better vice versa. Around this time also you had the Maserati MC12 Turbion. Those things were trading in the high 200s, almost $300,000. And today that watch is under $100,000, which to me is probably one of the most smoking deals out there on the complicated AP. That, and what they, when they followed up with the MC Carbon one, which is basically the MC12, but in the carbon case, right? Those things are way under 100 just the same right now. But again, times change and it's you guys that dictate, A, is this thing still popular? And it's you guys that dictate how popular things are, which is why when people ask me, it's mind blowing. Why, is, why are people paying, you know, $70,000 for a 5711 plain Jane watch and not pick up something like this for $60,000? Well, guess what? It's a pretty simple answer. This is what the general public likes and what the general public likes, everybody follows suit. So last but not least, I'm gonna quickly talk about the Pride of Argentina. It was a limited edition of 100 pieces. Pride of Argentina, Pride of CM, which is Pride of Thailand, uh, Pride of China, Pride of Russia. So this was part of uh, Audemars Piguet Pride series, right? This was one of the later ones. This one didn't do as well as the others for some reason because it was already during the time where the limited edition offshore hype was starting to die down a little bit just with too many series because if you add all the avenue pieces like Monte Napoleone, the Rome Festery, and the ones they made for all the boutiques, the New York boutique piece, right? The limited edition also started to lose their luster a little bit, which is why they took a humongous break before they came back with the Schumachers and they're popular once again, right? I had a client call me the other day and he's like, listen, I want the new titanium offshores. And those things are trading like in the mid twenties. And I told him, I said, why go that route? Why not go this route? Because personally, I think this is a much better looking watch and a much better buy. With the new titanium offshores, you're pretty much paying retail for the damn thing, right? Where with this limited edition watch, is, which you can pick up in the low to mid twenties as well, depending on how complete it is, is a better buy and a better look. And what I love most about, I didn't like the rose gold version of this. If you, if you can pop that on the screen, I particularly love this one because, and again, I apologize. I don't know how well the phone will show it, but this deep blue dial and these applied rose gold numbers that you see around the screen just pop extremely well on the watch for me. And this was actually one of my favorite looking limited edition offshores from the time. So I just wanted to throw that out there and show it to you. And again, these prides were limited, right? This was only 100 pieces. I think the rose gold, they only made in 50 pieces. For somebody that knows about collecting offshores, and there's still plenty of clients out there that I have that could, till, till this day collect limited edition offshores that are benefiting right now because they're lower in price. This thing was trading for like 35 grand, I remember back in the day. 
And right now, a lot of the collectors are priding themselves. So for those that know, know, among true limited edition offshore collectors, it's a pretty coveted watch and pretty rare. So I wanted to show you this thing. I'm probably gonna wear it for a little bit. Guys, I hope you, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode of What's on My Desk. This wasn't random, as you can tell. It wasn't just something that came across my desk. I wanted to put a point across in regards to how important you are as a collector. When I hear somebody screaming, oh my God, these dealers are raising the market. Oh my God, these dealers are lowering the market. Oh my God, oh my God, now it's you guys. You guys are the driving factor, the collectors that dictate market prices based on your purchases because based on the rate you guys buy in a popularity and demand on certain things is how we buy, right? It's also based on that is how manufacturers make their production numbers. Believe me, there's not a whole lot of AP millinaries being produced right now versus that of Royal Oaks and Royal Oak Offshores, right? And again, just because something is super old, if you guys don't really like it or take to it and are out there looking for the stuff, the prices are going to be much, much lower. And at the end, I just want to thank you guys for being there. Whether you love the watch or hate the watch, this is what keeps me and my company in business for almost 18 years now. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, as always, you know what I ask. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. If you're not a subscriber, and last but not least, share this video with your friends or those who you think may enjoy my content because this is what helps my channel grow organically. And I'll see you guys next week for more watch reviews and other videos.